Bolts Nation, welcome in to another episode of the Bolts Block Party. I am your host, Greg Wolf, joined by my co-captain, Braden Coburn. And I'm excited to finally get this gentleman. I know you've been clamoring for him for a yeah. while, and uh, we finally got him to take some time out of his busy day. Jeff Halpern. Halpy is here with us on the Block Party, and uh, it's good to finally get you on the show. I know we've had pretty much the whole team, the, the coaching staff, yeah, the trainers. He's, he's been busy scheming that power play and then getting those boys going. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, uh, to hang out with us today. So uh, we kind of want to go through the journey, uh, how, because, you know, we kind of want to give our fans some insight to, to your journey and how uh, it took you to get to the Tampa Bay Lightning here as one of our assistant coaches. But I literally want to go all the way back from your days uh, in Potomac. Uh, you actually have, a, there's a six degrees of separation here. He went to high school with my cousin at Churchill High School, which I showed you his yeah. high school photo with the Genera <laughs> sweatshirt on and everything. Um, but back then, like, Churchill didn't have a hockey team, right? So you had to transfer to a different school in New Hampshire, which kind of led you onto your hockey uh, path. But take us back to that and the journey. Yeah, how did you get into hockey anyway? Yeah, because, like, I mean... It's kind of a non-traditional hockey Yeah, were place. you a Caps fan growing up? I mean, what was, like, yeah, well, Dino Cicerelli days? and I liked Dino. Uh, Al Afrady? Like yeah. Uh, no, I, I think nationally in the U.S., um, hockey was a, a regional market, yep. a sport. And, you know, in D.C., Honestly, I, we were going public skating when I was younger, and uh, there was hockey practices afterwards, and and uh, it was it was basically they had a sign up sheet. And my dad grew up in New York. He you know, he didn't play hockey, but grew up a, a Rangers fan. Mm -hmm. um, so he liked the sport, and um, honestly, it was close to the house. It was, it, and I I picked up on it pretty quick. How old were you? Were you were I, like I start, started skating when I was three and, oh, and wow. four, kind of you know something right at the beginning. Your parents are taking you to go skating, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, the thing in DC and, and probably everywhere in those kind of cities in, in, uh, in the U S at that time, uh, it's good hockey and a lot of teams thin out around high school age, like, mm -hmm. uh, football is the big sport The yep. football coaches are recruiting the, right. They get all the best athletes. Oh, yeah. and... They have unreal speech. They came to the, the middle school and, uh, and it was, the speech was basically, if you play high school football, Janie and Susie are going to come knocking at your door. And he, the whole thing was about, it was an hour long and like the guys are going, yep, <laughs> yep. And everyone quits hockey and starts playing football. football yeah. And so to, to kind of move on in your hockey career, you start looking to, to go away. And at that time it was, it was prep school. Yep. Uh, even the USHL wasn't as big nationally as it is now. Um, so that was the next, I, I honestly just, I, I went to prep school just to continue playing maybe maybe to play college. So I'm assuming you were a really good athlete. Was, was, yeah, were you, you a football I, player too then or no? Uh, I was soccer, soccer, baseball, and hockey. Um, looking back, my dad discouraged me from soccer and baseball. He, he's allergic to bees. So he's trying, <laughs> he was trying to get me indoors. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I liked... Uh, All those bees nests on the fields <laughs> everywhere, playing <laughs> America. Right in Potomac. He, uh, at that time, there was the killer bees were coming up from... From uh, uh, Mexico. From Mexico. Yeah, okay. and so he was on high alert, and uh, <laughs> that's uh, that. Like that was only the start of it. Um, but anyways, I, I like hockey. Like yep. you get to 10, 11, 12, most youth sports, the coaches start making you pick, and then so then in high school you start saying where you want to go with athletics. And for me, I, I wanted a chance to keep playing, and that's how uh, I went away to school and end up in college and kind of on that path. So were you actually roommates with um, Ian McKee, like who was a I future was. bachelorette yeah. like winner? Did you know that? All he right. was his roommate, man. Did some uh, research on this. Was uh, that when you were playing for Princeton that you guys were roommates? No, that was – oh, no, it was, at, it was in high school. Okay, wow. But it was actually – it was funny. I, at the end of the year, um, I went out to, to California just to go have fun, and Ian joined me on the trip. We were driving from, from L.A. to Vegas, and he got the call from The Bachelor and, and – he, like, was, you know, so you he signed you, up for that. You oh, yeah, yeah. Someone <laughs> signed him up, uh, or someone put his name in. So they called him, and he's one of those guys, he, you know, Brazilian, good looking guy. But, you know, like he was, you're like, you're going to win, <laughs> right? You have to do something with this. So he went on the show. I think he was with her for maybe six weeks after it ended. And that, that was, was it. Yeah. So, in an alternate universe where Jeff Helpern's not married with kids. Are you on that show? No, I can <laughs> That's not in his I get, I, get, I get embarrassed on this show. I barely, uh, he actually, he's a great guy. And he, uh, at the very end, he like gets down on his knees and starts screaming. And like all of our buddies were like, it was, it was so embarrassing to know the guy. Like, so, uh, but he went through the whole process and. So uh, interesting. I, 
Glad we threw that out there. Uh, so you played for Princeton, right? And and had a pretty good successful run there. But were un, you were undrafted when you got picked up by the Caps in 1999-2000. How did you end up at Princeton in the first yeah. place? So I went to I went to high school uh, from the D.C. area. There was one, Matt Mulgrave was kind of the trendsetter. He was the first guy I went to go play at Harvard. And uh, our families became good friends, even to this day. Uh, uh, I'm still friends with Matt. But I wanted, I wanted to be like him. Like, that was my hero growing up. And so I went to St. Paul's. Uh, I had no Division One offers. Uh, mm. Coming out of school, I, I got accepted to Bowdoin, which is Division Three. Uh, deferred to Bowdoin, and then went to a spring a hockey night in Boston tournament. And there was uh, family there from Stratford, Ontario. Uh, ended up going uh, going to Stratford for a year in between, just to see if what would happen. And uh, and if nothing worked out, I could still go to Bowdoin. Uh, I discovered Canadian beer, uh, Tuesday night chicken wings. <laughs> And uh, I put on like 30 pounds and grew, you know, a few inches. Had to take some of the weight off. So was the goal but, was the goal to play in the NHL, or was it to get no, no, to I, college? I, uh, you know, just yeah. college, good, good college experience. Honestly, it's uh, it, it was always to keep playing. Like you, you know, even in college, you're like, well, maybe you get the chance to go play in Europe, or mm-hmm. you know. And so in high school, you're like, you wanna, you wanna go to college just to keep another four years of of competitive hockey and enjoy it. And people say it, you know, it's the best four years of your life. It honestly, it is because you're. You're in school with all your buddies, and uh, it, you know, it, it's it's an enjoyable experience. So I, I went to play juniors for that reason, and even in college, you you just you're playing, and mm-hmm. you think maybe if something works out, but that's four years down the line. So, so I mean, again, Princeton get un, you're undrafted, ninety nine, two thousand, get picked up by the Caps, and again, wasn't that like I mean, again, that's your hometown team, right? Too, right. Like, so like that's how did that feel to know that that happened for you? Like, I mean, do you remember that call that yeah, day? Well, I I. And I spoke to a few teams. I, I remember Washington won it, like like you said, uh, growing up there, yep. you always feel like, okay, Washington hasn't had success. I was going to go there and we're going to win the cup and going to march, you know, march the cup down the street. <laughs> yeah, man. And, uh, but that's in the back of your head because, honestly, I, I grew up rooting for them. Yep. Uh, the other part of it was, you know, they, the, the team was moving on and I knew I would get a, a, a look. Like if I was in camp, it wouldn't be another number, at least, the, mm-hmm. you know, you'd get, say, what about the, you know, the kid from Washington? So uh, that, that, you know, that was a factor going into it. Um, a few things happened. They made a, they traded away their fourth line center from the previous year. Yep. Dale Hunter moved on in his career and it kind of opened up this, this spot. And, uh, so everything worked out. I mean, 14 seasons in the league, obviously with the Caps twice, the Stars, the Bolts, the Kings, the Rangers, the Canadians, Coyotes. I feel like, Guys like Stammer and Hedman to be with one team for their career, that's almost an anomaly. You as well. I mean, how many teams did you play for? How many teams you played for? Is is that more Is that a weird <laughs> is it a weird way of calling him a suitcase? I, I just mean, want to know. All, because how many of the guys that we had on the show that have had yep, similar paths absolutely. like but again a fourteen year yeah. career. He's rich in experience. If that's you knew me well, you would say, like, is it, you know, for Stamkos and Hedman that are really good players. I mean, that too, but <laughs> two, I mean, to stay with one them. team, you know, um, it's hard to do these days. It's hard to do uh, for, for a, a ton of reasons. Um, but one of the things you find out kind of later in your career, I had no explanation earlier on, but one of the things is when teams don't win, they want to make changes. The easiest changes to make are the the older players because, you know, you have your your younger players that you're bringing up. And if you're not winning the cup, if you're not making the playoffs, the natural thing to do is is to move on and 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 try something new. So uh, there's a little bit of that. Uh, I've taken a lot of pride, and I I tell the players now, I was like, you, you want to be good at something because there's always a skill that's needed, and eventually someone's better at you than those things. Sure. Um, but if you're able to grab a, a niche in the NHL, not just on a team but in the NHL, you can you can play for for a long time, and it's it's a grind of a, of a career at times, but you're, you're, you're scratching, scratching and clawing just to try to keep playing. Right. It kind of goes back to what you were saying though. Like you just want to keep playing. And even when you get to the NHL, you just want to keep playing. You want to keep your job. You want to stay in the league as long as you possibly can. So 2008, you come here with the lightning. Uh, if you remember, that was a pretty big trade, right? Because you came in, uh, Smitty and Jokin in, right? And that was the draft for the exchange for Brad Richards and Holmquist, which obviously yeah. we know Brad Richards was just inducted into our, our Hall of Fame. Do you recall you scored that first game with the Bolts? Like, I, I, re- I remember two things. Okay. So I, I came in and I scored, yep. and I was like, I thought it was like a big, uh, you know, 
the FU to, to Dallas and yeah. like, look what you lost. Yeah. I think Richie had three points the next night. I think he, <laughs> I think I can't believe he went up to I can't believe it was a hat trick or if it was like if Richie was was unreal for that team. Uh and I went for I think we were second in the West to uh, finishing last in the East. So right. it was for me it was at that time in my career I, I didn't love the trade. Sure. Uh, I grew to I grew to like it. I grew to love the area and, and the team and everything. Um but at that time, yeah, it was it was a shock. So, so Stammer obviously comes to the organization uh, around that same time. Do you remember uh, your first interactions with Stammer? Yeah, well, the, the one thing I always say, like when you watch Cooch play now and Stammer and Hetty, I always say I, I have as much to do with this team winning cups based on how bad my t- <laughs> teams I was on. We, yeah. We were able to draft Stammer and, and Hetty, and, and kind of the list goes on. Set so the table. I was, yeah, <laughs> I, set the table. I contributed yeah. to this whole team. But uh, Stammer, my, my, honestly, the first thing, and it's, it, um, it's, I'm sure it sounds cliche, but Stammer came in and he was an immediate part of the team. Like we, we had a lot of older guys. Uh, I was hurt for the first part of his mm-hmm. uh, that season. But he just blended in so well with the, with the guys and everyone around him. Uh, he was kind of, he was mature beyond yeah. you know, his years, and uh, and that kind of carried on. Like he, he was one of the guys right away, and he's you know obviously he still is, has a good rapport with the team. Uh, but that was that was the first thing, um, uh, just kind of off the ice. Sure. And then on the ice, uh, you could say slow start, but you could see where all the talent was and where it was going. Oh eight as well. You were selected as captain for Team USA for the World Championships. So yeah, well that was my my last. I, I got carried off the ice. I always say like a, like a Rudy moment, like a Rudy moment. Yeah. But I was it was a torn ACL and <laughs> and Molly Molly was oh man Molly was actually the guy. So I so I actually I got traded here. I thought I did well, and yeah. even at that time, Torts was still the coach. Mm-hmm. And um, so I you know you want to be a part of it, and so that injury happened. And I remember stepping mm-hmm. off the ice, and I was like, <laughs> don't like, ever call me again for uh-oh. this thing. And oh. but it's um, yeah. So when you reflect back on your NHL career. Is there a place or a team that you kind of hold most, like just you like the best? Uh, and honestly, Tampa is 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 right up there just just because of um, kind of the group that we had. We had a, a really good group. I, I always uh, associate with Washington. It was probably I, it was more because of so many years and even memories as a kid. So I, I think Washington would be the one place. Montreal was the best hockey experience I had. I, I grew up. Uh, a huge hockey fan and in in dc you don't get games on tv <laughs> right. hockey night in canada and even back then you go to the games at the the old cap center it's you know they the crowds aren't great right it's kind of a, so montreal like it, it it feels like football in the u.s like the day of the game there's a buzz in, on the streets you can just you just feel it in, in in the city and so kind of to step onto that ice with the tradition that i i loved playing there i that was my uh, kind of hockey mecca, mm-hmm. so to speak, and um, so th- those two cities I always hold dear. I Tampa again was probably the most enjoyable because of the guys I was with at that time. So 2016, um, you're named the full time assistant coach for the Crunch. 2018, you took the role here with the Bolts when Rick Bonus exited. But how was that transition for you, uh, going from a seasoned veteran player to now the coaching role? What made you decide that you know what this is what I want to can do to continue my career in in the hockey yeah. world. And when like, did you know? Yeah, is like, there a time moment? in your career or is that something you always kind of thought about after? It was, it was probably always something I thought about. Um, I had a bad habit as a player, which I can say now. Uh, but you're always thinking, okay, what if we did this? What if we did that? And even... Um, questioning the coach? <laughs> not questioning the coach. <laughs> but you, you're, you're thinking about, you know, all those things. Yeah. Um, there's actually, there's a coach, uh, it's Dean Evanson. And I had him as an assistant, and it was his first meeting in the NHL come from juniors, and he gave the meeting, and I... I, I, <laughs> I have a want, question. I didn't, want, and I, I didn't do it to be... A, you know, I was just... Yep. Everything was very black and white. Even now in, in our coach's room, uh, some like I can be too black and white. Sometimes there has to be some gray areas in, in hockey for sure. Uh, but that wasn't like that wasn't well received by Dean. And I, I really liked Dean. I didn't even know until years later <laughs> sure. how much that impacted me. But I... I, uh, I, I just liked it. I liked the strategy of it. I liked the communication with players and, and the interaction. So it was always something I wanted to do. Uh, I did think I, re- I retired in uh, kind of in, basically in 2014, mm-hmm. and I thought I'd just kind of 
put my hand up and, and say, you know, I'm ready. Uh, who wants me as a coach? Sure. And it, it's when you retire, I was about 39 mm -hmm. or 40 even by that, by that time or 30, 38, 39. And, uh, there's guys that you're competing with in the coaching world that have been coaching for 18 years right. or, you know, 16 years. And it's, you're, you look at the resumes, you're like, man, this is pretty good. So I, I thought I had a good knowledge of the game. I thought I had, um, I thought I'd be able to interact with, with the players. Well, I thought I'd be good at it, but you don't realize how many good coaches are out there. So it, it took a little bit of uh, work to, to get into that spot. Let, let me ask you about, um, cause sometimes you have a, pl a certain persona as a player and you have a certain persona that you want to exemplify as a coach. And I remember talking to Rick bonus and I said, Rick, you know, you went from being a player coach mm -hmm. to transitioning to be a coach. And how, how did you know what type of coach you wanted to be? And he told me he wanted to be the type of coach that he would have wanted to have been coached as. Interesting. And I just found that interesting. And I was, I'm wondering what kind of coach you kind of set out to be or trying to be. Yeah, well, I, I, the quickest answer is just I, I do think you have to coach your personality. I, I think if you, if you go outside of that, it can, it can come off as being fake. And so that's, that's one thing I, I – I've learned more and more is trying trying to be true to your own right. personality. Not because probably nothing worse than having a coach that's trying to be like a tough guy or somebody's not. Players are able to see right through that immediately. Yeah, and I, and and e even at times I I've worked for coaches where I I'm talking I don't feel like it's my voice coming out. You're trying to you you're trying to use words or or, or terms and sometimes just being new to a, a coach, but trying to use those terms that they would use. And when you're searching for those. Um, uh, those thoughts it, it it can it can be hard i my my best example is when i first started coaching uh ben grew was the, the head coach in uh in syracuse and we would talk and he'd say well that's the player in you and he was trying to get me more as a as a coach and so one of the things i consciously did i didn't do drills and i didn't like i've seen coaches jump into drills and as a player you're like oh my god look at this, <laughs> yeah. this guy still thinks he can do it so i consciously didn't do it at some point I learned, I'm like, man, if you're not teaching the guys how to do those skills, like, what are you, are you doing? Right. There's a thousand guys that can like put X's and O's on the board. You're trying to, you're, you're looking at football and, and hockey and, but all these sports are going, you got to teach the guys that skill, the skills that go in the game. So I kind of changed that and, and went back and, and, and relearned those and how to teach those as well. So that was, that was part of it. Um, I, I agree, uh, personality wise you have to do that sometimes like as a player you 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 have a different personality too as a player sure like you, you step on the ice and if you if you're a quiet guy off the ice there's a lot of quiet Terrence you know is a quiet guy off the ice right but I, w I wouldn't mess with him on the <laughs> ice um so you're trying to harness some of that sure competitive and spirit and some of that fire uh as a coach as well can you explain to our fans um the differences in roles of our coaching staff between you, Zettler, Blaschel, like what is the differences of your guys' roles with our team to kind of help our fans understand the different roles that you guys have? Well, I, I, I think this group, especially Coop, takes a lot of pride in, in being a collaborative group. Like we've, even from the first time I stepped foot in that office, every meeting, every coach is contributing and, and uh, I, I, I think it's one of the best parts of, of coaching is you're, you go in this place where you're just talking hockey really. Right. And, and what might work and what player and all these things and what they need. So that, that part of it is, is a lot of fun. Uh, assistant coaches. So Rob Zettler runs the, the defense, um, uh, like defensive zone, kind of how we come out of the zone. Jeff Blaschel runs the neutral zone, kind of the, the, with the puck and without the puck. And I would run the offensive zone that that's by title. Um, Every like I said, everyone contributes. I think the guy like Blash, because of his background as a head coach, he he's contributed a ton to every part of our game. Uh, we split up. I, I work with a power play. Those two assistants work uh, on the penalty kill. But even then, like I'll ask those guys, you know, how would you defend this? Or when you're when you're killing a penalty like this, what are you guys looking for? So um, we have those titles, but I, I do think it's a, a group. And obviously, Coop at the end of the day is the guy who puts the hammer on this. Sure. And so how are you consistently trying to uh, learn and adapt and, and put those things to use with the players? Because obviously the game has changed since when you played to what it is now. How are you constantly evolving as a coach? I, I 
the biggest thing there's there's so much information even even for players like they're like the the access to the video their own shifts and 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 plays that other teams are making like it, it's it's all around you so even as a coach there's skills coaches there's people giving speeches on power plays and you're looking at all those things we have like if you have a thought of anything we have a department that can put even that sequence of events like a pass from this side of the ice to that side uh, they can get you every piece of video in the league and you can kind of give that analysis so you're, you're trying to learn from other teams you're trying to learn from everyone else my biggest um, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not perfect at it, but I remember Mar Marty St. Louis came in here. It, it was, uh, I think it was his hall of fame induction, mm -hmm. not, not, not here, but right. the, the, uh, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So I was a new coach and I showed him the meeting that I showed the power play and, uh, his first kind of reaction to it was, he's like, it's great, but you're giving them such direction. He's like, what are the, what are the guys think? What are the guys saying? And he's like, if the guys are in running those meetings you're not hearing like what each person thinks and we have a group that they've been together so long sometimes you tell them things and they're like yeah we got it mm -hmm. like, you know they they know but but i i i'm learning as much from our current players as i am from around the league so it's like a collaboration like you talked about the collaboration in the coaches room but it's also with the players like you can't just tell them you need to do this they're telling you giving you as much feedback as as you are the other way around which yeah and we try to you know, especially after games or, or when when things aren't going well, you say, okay, what do we what do we need? What do you what do you guys? So you're going to Cooch saying that, or Stammer, or Hetty, or something like that. Yeah, and, and know it like Cooch is, he's so smart. Sometimes you tell him, he just one nod, and you're like, yeah, but you understand. He's like, you know, got it. in his own words, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I got it. I, right. I got it before you told me. Um, but I, I like Stammer is a great person to talk to about the game and uh, and everyone in their own kind of. Um, uh, uh, skill or role on our team is is great to get feedback. They're they're the ones on the ice. They're the ones who see it kind of yeah. live, and for us to say, well, why don't you do this? Sometimes there's a there's a reason that that they see why why it can or can't be done. I wanted to ask, from your experience now as as a coach, what's the hardest thing about coaching? Mm. Uh, I I'd say some when you can't get. Uh, a message across when you can't help a player. Like, we, you know, uh, I was thinking about this going in. The the other side, what's the best thing? Uh, the games are always, you know, the, the most, uh, the, the best all-around feel. But when you work with someone or a group uh, and they do it, they do something that you help them get to, whether, you know, whether they had it or they just kind of tweaked it a little bit. But when you see them have success on the ice and it leads to the team success, that's the best feeling. So to your question, what's the the hardest thing? The hardest thing is when you just can't you can't make something work. Right. And you even see it on the biggest level with head coaches. They just say, "I I'm round peg in a square uh, hole." Yeah, I'm just, it's not working, and that's when that's when it's over. And so, for, you know, my job is at a much more micro scale than that. Like mm -hmm. I'm working with a player to try to in, increase his skills, even like in a certain spot on the ice. And if he's not getting that, I'm like, when you 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 feel bad for yourself, you feel bad for the player because you're like, he needs he needs help in that area. He's not getting it from me. So what do we what do we do now? So that's that's the hardest part. And uh, you know, there's ways to work through that and all that. You know, but um, that would that would be an answer. What do you recall about this guy and his uh in his play? Oh, please. Oh, no. No, we I, gotta, I, no. Let's ask the coach. No, no. I, well, for one, I've told him he he should still be playing. So okay. I, I, still in great shape. I'm still, too, I'm man. still mad at him a little bit for uh, for dumb. But it's I think at the I mean, there's too many healthy bag skates. It wore out my hip. <laughs> that was that was that was uh, uh, unreal professional, mm -hmm. unreal competitor. Um, now we were lucky enough that we won championship. Yep. So. When when and even the, the season prior to that, we won sixty two games. So you're seeing a lot of really good, successful things. I I think uh, we had a group with like McDonough and Colby and Hedman and Girardi and Straw. Like these are like they're, they're kind of like Hall of Fame defenders. Sure. And so to be around those guys, um, you're learn like you're learning every day. Uh, I, I uh, I'm hoping it's not painting someone in a corner. They 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 were given a presentation. And it was about what to do on a two-on-one, and it was it was a good presentation. But then Kobe and this group, they're like, "Yeah, we get it, but 
this this happens more in a game. Sure. And I remember this like the heads exploded of the people in the presentation. <laughs> but but Kobe is like one of those they're 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 fun to coach because they enjoy the game. They're competitive and um, they kind of they give the results on the ice. So I, I've I've actually had more fun having a couple of um, ice teas on his porch or something like that, watching the hurricane. Then then uh, as a coach, sometimes you're you're trying to stand off in in the background. But he's one of those guys you're you you love coaching. Him. You love being a part of him, like on those teams. So. Well, I was going to say the part that I remember about Helpy was actually as a player, like the battles yeah. and this, the, you know, seems like a nice guy here, but he was sometimes a little bit cheap on the ice. You know, there's some little, like, <laughs> didn't take a lot of crap, you know, right. and he's not the biggest guy. So as a defender, you're thinking I'm going to be able to impose my will on this sure. guy a lot. Right. So maybe I can get a few. Helpy would always kind of let you know there was, there was, he, Liberty's taken on him you know, didn't go unanswered. No doubt. And uh, it was, so it was pretty exciting when, you know, a guy's not that far removed from playing. He's got a good insight and in understanding how how the game's still played at this moment because, you know, and and then to have him coach and give that insight and, and we've had some some good talks and, and uh, it's been really good. I, my, my first things I did on every team, I, I, I took the tough guys out pretty okay. quick. You, you know, so, <laughs> Setting the tone. So however tall I was, like you get a little bit taller when those guys have your back. And uh, the first first lineman was Chris Simon sure. uh, when I went to Washington. Yeah. So like when you line up in your first training camp with that guy on your left, you're like, you feel like <laughs> right. whatever you want. Sure. So. Is the ultimate goal happy to eventually be a head coach in this league? I, I would like to. I, you know, I, I, I like working with, with Coop and I'm, I always, I, I've always said to you, working in the AHL, I, I try to enjoy every season and sure. kind of you take it from there. I, I, I've always been a uh, um, someone who enjoys kind of the gamesmanship of everything, and, and I, I, I would love kind of that the, 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 the tinkering and kind of the, mm-hmm. the, what goes on in, in game. Um, so it's something I, I, I would like to do, but it's not something like in this season, I'm like, all right, I got right. I got to be in this spot. Help you. What's the difference between your best highlight as a player and your best highlight as a coach? Is there a difference, or do you kind of like you don't see a difference between them? No, it's I playing is. Um, I I think we can both say playing the NHL. It's you're living a, a dream. So mm-hmm. when you score a big goal, like I look at it, it's on our wall. Kobe's goal in the playoffs against the Rangers. Um, when you have those big moments, that's that's undescribable. And um, as a as a coach, obviously I the. Winning a cup is, is 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 the biggest professional thing that I've done. You know, in playing, playing is is um, though it's you're in the battle, you're in those things. I, I would say coaching is the closest thing you can get to to playing. Uh, without doing that, um, I always I think of the the quote in in Montreal, and I'll butcher it, but basically like we can't do it anymore, so we're kind of passing the torch off to you guys. Right. And um, so I you know and. When you play it's a game you did as a kid you didn't grow up sitting on the sidelines right kind of like you know you stand here you're you're in the battle and in, in with your buddies and all that uh i look at it now as fondness of those guys what they're going through do you do you still miss not playing i do but i don't seek it out it's like um i would i <laughs> there's like so many kids i gotta uh but i i yeah i like the games like one of my highlights was uh was in COVID, we could only skate with, I forget if it was like eight guys or nine guys, something like that. So I would fill in for the group that was under. We'd play these scrimmages, and I treated it like it was game seven of the <laughs> Stanley Cup. And so uh, that was, that, that was I couldn't do that now. That was three three years ago. I was closer. Right. And and even if you ask those guys, they'd be like, Kobe, you'd be like, you couldn't do it then. <laughs> right. But um, but I, I miss playing. Yeah, it's, it's a fun sport. That's pretty awesome. Before we get into our fact or fiction, um, what have you most learned being with John Cooper for the last eight years or so? What's you like the biggest takeaway you could say? Uh, professionally, I'd say just his confidence, like how, how he walks into the players' room, how he conducts a meeting, how he's in the media. Uh, and I said, you, coaches have to coach their personality. That's that's his personality. Yeah. Like, and it comes off on the team, and that's why uh, every one of his teams. You know, in Tampa and even going back to Norfolk and USHL, they, they're good teams and they, they carry that confidence well. Um, pro, like 
personally, privately, he's he's so good to his staff and the people around him and his friends. That, you know, like even if they're not my friends, you, you see how he interacts. Uh, he's he's very generous with his coaches. Wants to see us do well, and uh, he's a competitive guy. So sometimes he like he his temperature rises quite a bit, mm-hmm. and you're in the middle of that. I I always appreciate. I I think he, he comes to you whether it's in that moment or maybe the next day. And, and I, he will apologize, but I'm like, I, I don't want to say apologize because that would make him sound like he's wrong. Uh, but he always comes to you and mit- lets you know that it's not, it's not you, know, right. you. it's the, it's the what, environment it's what's going right. on. Yeah. So good stuff. All right. Jeff Halpern, fact or fiction powered by our friends at Highlight IPA. Again, these are either true or not true statements. Yeah. I mean, they may be tweaked a little bit. Uh, so you got to pay attention to the details if you will. So the very first one, um, after we won the cup, you built a new deck at your house and named it after Victor Hedman. True. That's true. Why? And what, so why, why, yeah, give us the whole backstory of that. Great story. Actually. Okay. So tell us the story why you named your deck after Victor. So one of the best lessons I've ever learned as a coach is you got to communicate with your players. Okay. Uh, we were, Hedy would like, Hedy, there's some, a couple things going on. We were going into the bubble. We didn't know who was going to be on the power play. I didn't communicate it well with Hetty, and we basically Sergey started that playoffs as the kind of the number one power play guy, so to speak. Uh, Hetty was unreal in those plays. He was he won the Conn Smythe. He was he was unreal. Uh, eventually, uh, just kind of took over the whole thing. And uh, I talked to him about it. I was like, hey, uh, and I was like, just you know, I thought you were unreal. And he's like, I I I was mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so we get uh, in our contracts that you get playoff incentives and playoff bonuses. Sure. And we wanted to put a, a front porch on our house, yeah. but that playoffs gave us the resources to, to do, do it. So I said, this is the porch that had been built. Does it so, uh, have a plaque or anything? I wanted the guy to carve in a 77 to it, but we'll maybe still, not, maybe still do I, it. Hedy's got to come over for, uh, for a beer first. Still hasn't done it. Okay. So when he does that, we'll do it. Hedy, yeah. pay attention. You got one, Kobe. All right. During my extensive research of looking back at your old YouTube clips, oh boy, <laughs> I found one of you beating up Vinny LeCavier in a fight. Fact or False. fiction? False. Did he beat you up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I he was Vinny was eighteen. I was twenty three, and uh, I was gonna I was gonna embarrass him in Tampa. I was gonna like I was gonna you know uh, I knew a little bit about fighting and all that stuff. You were going to fight the teenager. Yeah, and I actually, there was a, I was going to beat up the teenager. <laughs> but I was going to grab his, Kobe knows, he, he grabbed his right arm and you reach over and grab his left arm. You got both arms and he's got both arms right. tied up. You do whatever you want. I, I did that. All I had was the Tampa Bay lo- Lightning logo. He okay. had both arms free and he just, he started hitting me. I think I threw a slap in <laughs> at one point like this. But they, one of the punches hit, it ripped my gum off. And so they, they're stitching my gum back on, oh and the guys are like, Chris Simon's like, hey, good job, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not, that's false. I did, okay. not, I did not win that fight. That is fiction. Okay. I can confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Halpy, fact or fiction, early in your career, when you played for the Caps, you did not want to play on Ovechkin's line. That's true. Why? Uh, it's a question for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, like she, she's not. I'm sure she doesn't even know. But uh, basically, we played the first ten games together. I think I was over a point a game. I was on pace to probably sign a nine-year gazillion dollar contract. Uh, okay, but I didn't know where Ovi was on the ice. Like I was a very, like I said, black and white. Like yep. you got to be in these spots. You look up and like Ovi's. Yeah, he's like, a young teenager. He's yeah, flying all right. over the I ice. I don't even know where he is. And I'm like, I went to Glenn Hanlon. I was like, I, I can't play with this guy. Like he's, <laughs> he's all over. The- and he's like, yeah, okay. So I put him on the line with, I, with Brian Wilsey and Matt Pettinger. And uh, and Chris Clark went up to the line with Dana Zubris and Ovi. And like, it was like, it's like watching Cooch and Pointer. And they're just scoring, scoring, scoring. And like once in a while, you get like a good back check or a block. And you come to me and pick a good block. And you're like, oh, I could have been out there. So that was a, oh, okay. That's, that's a fact. Yeah. All right. So again, during my research, I found an interesting uh, face-off between you and Blues assistant coach Steve Ott. And everyone knows about Ryan Callahan getting licked by Brad Marchand. Yep. I found one of Steve Ott giving you a nice lick on a face-off. Uh, true. 
That's true. That's fixed. It was, that's a, it was the uh, half shield. Well, Otter's my guy. I, I, Otter is, he's, uh, he's probably the best um, in game trash talker. Like the lines that he's come up with are unreal. But we used to, like, we practiced face offs when we were together in Dallas. And back then, you can kind of put your head over the dot. They've changed that rule since then. They, they'll kick you out or yep. make you move back. But we used to see who could get lower and lower and lower. And so our, our heads would be like right on top of each other. And he just he went in for the lick. Right there. He was a pre uh, Marchand. Oh, yeah. It's still gross, man. The fact that you remember I knew that. there was a story behind it, but yeah. <laughs> well, there's pictures of that one, too. All right, Fact or Fiction, Jeff Halpern, you own a donut shop in the D.C. area. That's uh, it's true. What's it's it called? Well, now it's a, uh, it's both. It's a Astro Donuts and Fried Chicken and then Astro Beer Hall. So, <laughs> All this right. Uh, and I, so me and my buddy started this in 2012, 11, okay. somewhere in there. And it's, it's grown and shifted and all these things. And, um, it's, uh, it's something I didn't know much about sure. in the beginning. Obviously I know more now, but it's something my buddy's kind of, they run it. Yeah. And I, I talked to him quite a bit, but is there a donut on the menu named after you? No. No, I try to take a as much, like it, it's not a good career move. I mean, like, yeah. As if a there hockey. was a creation of a donut that was uh, yours, and what would it be? Like, what's your what's your? I don't. I've 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 taken more to the chicken sandwich. So, not a donut. I don't. I don't. Know. Do they be donut chicken sandwiches? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they, so that's the whole thing. Do the whole thing. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's just funny coming I from. Think about that. I'm just laughing. Such right a now. pro athlete to have a donut and chicken and beer spot. It's just, yeah, you know, that's healthy. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have another one. If you don't, I have another one. Sure. Uh, fact or fiction, your nickname in the locker room is Omaha Rain Delay. <laughs> uh, true. So that's. Uh, Give us a story on that one. That came from Nigel, that's by the way. In, that's in the coach's room. But the when I used to play cards, it took me a while on every move. So Brian Wolsey would call me, like Steve Traxel, I think was a pitcher for the Mets. They called him the human rain delay. Yeah. So every time he pitched, he'd take so long in between pitches. So sometimes, like, when I'm, you know, like, it's time right. to make a decision. I'm like, rain delay. It takes a long time. And then, so that was the rain delay. And then the other one is, like, we'll be walking out to practice, and I'll be like, we should let, we should do this, we should do this. So, um, like, Peyton Manning, yep. when he Omaha, comes up to Omaha. my yeah. So we do a lot of, like, Change it right at the last second. Okay. And now I Coop has a rule. I'm not allowed to talk to him five minutes before we go on the ice anymore. <laughs> just so he doesn't want to hear it. I love it. You have another? I, I got do. one more. Okay. So I you have the record for most lunches bought, but least amount of suppers paying the bill. Uh I'd probably say false. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember buying a lunch. Suppers. Uh, I heard you're you're problem. you're quick to buy lunch, but you're not quick so to buy, quick to buy a supper. Here's the problem. They, okay. I don't eat steak anymore. They always go to steakhouse. Okay. We're going to Thai in Toronto. <laughs> I'll pick up the Thai <laughs> restaurant. And so it comes off as a little different too. Okay. And the final fact or fiction, Jeff Halpern, during a pre, the, like the pre-pandemic time, you once forgot your skates for a practice day and had to use figure skates to participate. False. False. Okay. I don't know. I heard it through the grapevine that one time you forgot your skates. And actually had to use. You say false. Okay. I think I used Nigel skates. Okay. Well, that's that's, that's like figure skates. That's, that's like figure skates. Pretty skate. close. I I want to know though. I, looking at all these old photos of you um, today, it seems like your hairline has gotten better as a coach <laughs> as it than it was I as actually, a player. This was the worst thing of doing this today. Is I actually had to like go in the shower and like brush my hair. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, a lot of short hair. I did do the frosted tips at one point in my career. And uh, we have so, it in high school too. So I mean, there's a lot of regrets. I have a picture of you from your yearbook. I showed it to you. I don't before. know if I could. I don't know if we did frost. You you have uh, you know when you well, watch the coaches on TV, you know, Coop's getting you know he's thinning out a little bit. Uh, probably some stress. Zets and uh, Blash, obviously not, not on the, I don't the highest end, but too. not fr not frosted. But you I, had the generis. Sweatshirt. I had that haircut uh, for about till I was about thirty five. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not that I'm, far off, I'm, really. I'm, I'm I mean, do, it's I'm a strong, close. it's a strong hairline. <laughs> yeah. That's a Churchill High School. I think that was your junior year, maybe. That is a nice. You sweater. look small though. Yeah. Man. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Jeff, for taking the time. This was an awesome, awesome conversation, and um, we wish you guys nothing but luck down the stretch. It's, we're getting hot at the right time. It seems like everything's gelling right now. So, uh, just congratulations on all the success thus far, and we're so happy to have you here with the Lightning Organization, and uh, we wish you nothing, nothing but success moving forward. Good. Appreciate Cheers. you. All right. Thank you. Kobe and I, we appreciate all of you guys once again checking in with us here on the Bolts Block Party, powered by our friends at Highlight IPA, and we will catch you guys a new episode next week.